David, Jenna, thank you very much for worship, leading us to worship this morning. I enjoyed it. Good morning, all. Well, let's open in prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. Thank you for your holy word and for the light it shines to us. Uh, Lord, let this message bring you glory. Uh, let us, let the conviction that you bring to us bring you glory. Let us bring you glory throughout this week. I ask in Jesus' name, amen. So, I'm going to be in the book of Matthew, mostly. I'll dash about the verses here and there. Uh, Matthew is 28 chapters, so I'm not going to do the whole book of Matthew. Just half of it. Um, Because y'all know I like to look at verses and chapters uh, within the context of the rest of the book. And so before we dive into the verse today, we are going to do a little cliff note review. Uh, Matthew chapters 1 and 2. That's a horrible time to lock up computer. Okay. Thank you, dear. I appreciate it. Stuff underneath that pad there is a little the pen part of my computer. I need the pen. Technology is great when it works. got it. Yay, okay. All right, so back to the review. Matthew chapter 1 and 2 gives us the genealogy of Jesus and the story of his birth and childhood. Chapter 3 introduces John the Baptist. In chapter 4, Satan tempts Jesus right before Jesus starts his ministry with the opening line, Repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Spoiler alert, that's the overarching theme of his entire ministry. He then calls his first four disciples and starts to heal a great multitude right before giving the greatest speech ever given in the history of mankind, the Sermon on the Mount. Recorded over the next three chapters, giving us mind-blowing concepts such as the Beatitudes, salt and light, declaring that he fulfills the law, raising the standard of, standards of murder and adultery, telling us to love our enemies, teaching us how to pray, commanding us not to worry, how to judge rightly, ask, seek, knock, the narrow way, knowing prophets by their fruits, and finishing his sermon with two powerful points, the first being those that, we, that he never knew, and the second being building on the rock. These final words of his sermon lay the foundation of what I want to focus on today, so I'm going to read it to you, Matthew 7, verses starting at 21. Not everyone that, said unto me, that saith unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven, but he that doeth the will of my Father which is in heaven. Many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name? And in thy name have we cast out devils? And in thy name done many wonderful works? And then I will prof profess unto them, I never knew you. Depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever heareth these sayings of mine, and doeth them, I will liken him unto a wise man, which built his house upon the rock. 
And the rain descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon the rock. And everyone that heareth these sayings of mine and doeth them not shall be likened unto a foolish man which built his house upon the sand. And the rain descended, and the flood came, and the winds blew and beat upon that house, and it fell, and great was the fall of it. And it came to pass, when Jesus had ended these sayings, the people were astonished at his doctrine, for he taught as one having authority and not as the scribes. By chapter 8, because of the, of the powerful sermon, great multitudes follow him. As Jesus tries to focus on teaching the masses, the masses keep bringing their problems to him. So Jesus gets busy with the miracles, healing a leper, a centurion's servant, Peter's mother-in-law, a multitude of sick and demon-possessed. And to really blow the minds of his disciples, he calms the wind and the waves. Right in the middle of these amazing acts of God, he talks about the cost of discipleship. First, starting in verse 18. Now, when Jesus saw great multitudes about him, he gave commandment to depart to, onto the other side. And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee wheresoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. And Jesus said to him, follow me. Let the dead bury their dead. Let's pause here and clarify the term disciple. During witness encounters, I will ask somebody if they are a Christian. Many say yes. If they identify as a Christian, I follow up by asking if they are a disciple. Not as many say yes to that. The term Christian is found three times in the Bible, Acts 11, 26, and the disciples were first called Christians in Antioch. Acts 26, 28. Then Agrippa said to, unto Paul, Almost thou persuadest me to be a Christian. And finally in 1 Peter 24, 8, 16. If any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in his belief. On his behalf. Sorry. You ask ten different people to define Christian, you will get eight different answers. It can mean anything you want in this day and age. It was originally an insult given to the disciples by others. The term disciple, on the other hand, is more defined. Christ has clear outlines of what qualifies one to be a disciple, many of which we will see today. In chapter 9, Jesus brings a tax collector named Matthew to the team, answers some questions about fasting before getting back to work for giving and healing a paralytic and a woman that's been bleeding for 12 years and blind men, and a mute man, and raising a girl from the dead, and having compassion on the masses, as summarized in the last four verses. You know, my wife said the key thing is to focus on not talking too fast so everyone can understand me. And I guess the fact I have to keep reloading my sermon will make sure that happens. God knows I need to slow down. Verse 35 in chapter 9. And Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in the synagogues and preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. But when he saw the multitudes, he was moved with compassion on them, because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Then saith he unto his disciples, The harvest truly is plenteous, but the laborers are few. Pray ye therefore, the Lord of the harvest, that he will send forth laborers into his harvest. In chapter 10, Jesus promotes his top 12 disciples to apostles by giving them power and prepares them to go out to the house of Israel to preach and heal and raise people from the dead and cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. He warns them before they go that persecutions are coming. Jesus then tells them where they will come from in verses 21 and 22. And the brother shall deliver up the brother to death, and the father the child, and the children shall raise up against their parents and cause them to be put to death. 
And ye shall be hated of men for my name's sake, but he that endureth to the end shall be saved. Jesus then reminds them to fear God more than men before providing more clarity in what he expects of his disciples in verse 32 through 39. Whosoever therefore shall confess me before men, him will I also before my Father which is in heaven. But whosoever shall deny me before men, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. Think not that I come to send peace on earth. I came not to send peace, but a sword. For I come to set man at variance against his father, and the daughter against her mother, and the daughter-in-law against her mother-in-law. And a man's foe shall be they of his own household. He that loveth father and mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. He that findeth his, findeth his life shall lose it. And he that loseth his life for my sake shall find it. After he finishes commanding the twelve and sends them off at the beginning of chapter 11, John the Baptist sends some messages to Jesus. And after Jesus answers them, he talks to the masses about John the Baptist. He then places some curses on the unrepented cities that he has been in. And at the end of the chapter, Jesus gives the closest thing to an altar call that he has ever said. Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. In chapter 12, Jesus starts really upsetting the Pharisees by letting his disciples pluck grain on the Sabbath and declaring himself Lord of the Sabbath and healing a withered hand on the Sabbath and fulfilling the prophecy, a prophecy of Isaiah. Then the Pharisees accuse him of casting out demons by the power of the ruler of demons. Then Jesus explains how stupid that is and accuses them of the unpardonable sin and calls them a brood of vipers. Let me explain the depth of that insult really quick. Most vipers do not lay eggs. And the synagogue were poisoned by the burdens of the Pharisees. When Jesus insults you, he really knows how to stick it to you. As if to prove Jesus' point, the Pharisees try to burden Jesus by demanding a sign from him. Because the teaching and miracles of the last nine chapters weren't enough. Jesus then tells them that their wicked, adulterous, evil generation will get their sign over his dead body. Literally, three days after his body's dead. In the middle of his argument, his family shows up outside to talk to him. He respond, he responds, his response is also worth noting for the point I will eventually get to. But he answered and said unto him that told him, Who is my mother, and who are my brethren? And he stretched forth his hand towards his disciples and said, Behold, my mother and my brethren. For whosoever shall do the will of my Father, which is in heaven, the same is my brother and sister and mother. Now in the beginning of chapter 13, it says the same day, the same day when Jesus out of the house, it was the same thing as arguing there, and sat by the sea, and the great multitudes were gathered together unto him, so that he went into his sh a ship and sat, and the whole multitude stood on the shore. He then shares seven different parables, and he explains the purpose of parables in verses 10 through 15. And the disciples came and said unto him, Why speaketh thou unto them in parables? He answered and said unto them, Because it is given unto you to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to them it is not given. For whosoever has, to him shall be given, and he shall have more abundant. But whoever has not, from him shall be taken away, even that he has. Therefore speak I unto them in parable, because they seeing see not, and hearing they hear not, neither do they understand. And in them is fulfilled the prophecy of Isaiah, which saith, By hearing they shall hear and shall understand, and seeing they shall see and shall not perceive. For this people's heart is waxed growth, and their ears are dull of hearing, and their eyes they have closed. Lest at any time they should see with their eyes, and hear with their ears, and should understand with their hearts, and, I should, and should be converted, and I should heal them. After dropping all these riddles, he heads to his hometown of Nazareth and is rejected. In chapter 14, John the Baptist is beheaded. Jesus feeds 5,000 people with five loaves and two fish. 
Then he takes a walk on the sea, because he can. I would if I could. Then the sick line the roads just to touch the hem of his garment and are made perfectly well. By chapter 15, some scribes and Pharisees from Jerusalem caught up with Jesus on the other side of the sea to argue with him about why his disciples won't wash their hands. I wonder if they ever realize the pathetic level of their desperation to pin something on Jesus. Jesus, of course, flips the fault back on them, as he points out in verses 7 through 9. The suspense is killing me, I'm sure. Writing 14, right? Ye hypocrites! Well did Isaiah prophesy of you, saying, This people draw off nigh unto me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. But in vain do they worship me, teaching for doctrines the commandments of men. He then explains the latest parable to his disciples because they are having trouble putting two and two together on their own. Then he came across a Canaanite woman that begged him for healing for her daughter. Then he tried to sneak away to a mountaintop, but the multitudes brought the lame and blind and name up the mountain to him. You ever try to escort a blind man up a mountain? Uh, so, of course, he healed them and he fed the 4,000. And the 4,000 with seven loaves and a few little fish. That's a few, it's not a count, just a few little fish, like little fish, sardines maybe. So he hops in the boat and goes to the region of Magdala. And now we're at the beginning of chapter 16. Which, I think we're getting close. I'll print it out next time. So the beginning of chapter 16, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are at it again. This time they are demanding a sign from heaven. Now back in chapter 12, they asked for him a sign. He told them the only sign they are getting was a sign of Jonah. Since that encounter, Jesus fed and healed multiple multitudes and walked on water, all of which undoubtedly became well known to everyone. So now they, are, they aren't asking for, a, for just a sign, but a sign from heaven. You know, they, they, they're up in the game here on the request. It is abundantly obvious at this point that there is no amount of proof that will satisfy these religious leaders. Often when debating with someone that claims there is no proof of God, I ask them the following. If I could show you sufficient evidence to your satisfaction that the God of the Bible is real, would you worship him? Would you accept his sovereign claim on your life and submit to his will if you had all the proof you needed? Most say no. To which I say, well then, your lack of faith is not logical or intellectual. Once again, once again, Jesus insults them and tells them that the only sign they're getting is a sign of Jonah, and then he departs. Then he warns his disciples about the religious leaders, but they think he's talking about bread. Jesus gets a little short with them and helps them figure out what he meant. Once they get to the region of Caesarea Philippi, Jesus gives the disciples a pop quiz to see what they know so far. First he asks, whom do men say that I, this, I the Son of Man, am? They give four different answers. And then at verse 15, who saith, un, he saith unto them, but whom say ye that I am? And Simon Peter answered and said, thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said unto him, blessed art thou, Simon Bar, Barjona, for flesh and blood have not revealed it unto thee, but my Father which is in heaven. And I say unto, unto, also unto thee, thou, that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And I will give unto thee the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt bind on earth shall be bound in heaven, and whatsoever thou shalt loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. I could not personally ask, for better honor than to hear the voice of God incarnate say to me that he will use me as a foundation for his church. Jesus then tells them to keep this to themselves for now, then shares with them what the sign of Jonah means. 
And then verse 22, then Peter took him and began to rebuke him, saying, Be it far from thee, Lord, this shall not be unto thee. But he turned and said unto Peter, Get thee behind me, Satan, thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. Jesus refers to his beloved Peter as Satan. In verse 19, Peter's being promised the keys of the kingdom. Four verses later, he's now Satan. As soon as you start to savor things of men or things of God, you become an offense to Christ. And this brings us to verse 24 through 28, the focus of my message. Then, he, then Jesus said unto his disciples, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life for my sake shall find it. For what is a man profited if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what will a man give in exchange for his soul? For the Son of Man shall come in the glory of his Father with his angels. And then he shall reward every man according to his works. Verily I say unto thee, there be some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now that last sentence put urgency of God's message into his servants when they remembered all these words after his resurrection. And so many of them thought for sure he was coming while they still lived. And that's why they waited till later years, like, we better write this down. We might not be around to see this. But, and some skeptics say that, well, Jesus is lying here because he died. And he, he left. All those people died and they didn't see the final coming. But John, the apostle, did in the Revelation. Because the book of Revelation is pre-recorded history. It's a historical book that hasn't happened yet. Luke 9 puts it this way. If, and he said to them all, If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake shall find it, shall save it. For what is a man's advantage if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For, what's, for whosoever shall be ashamed of me and my and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed, when he shall come to the, his own glory, and in his fathers, and in his holy angels. Key to not scroll too fast, it locks up. Not to scroll too slow that everyone's still waiting. It's a fine art. But I tell you the truth, there are some standing here which shall not taste of death till they see the kingdom of God. And again in Luke 14, we find, If any man come to me and hate not his father and mother and wife and children and brethren and sisters, yea, and his own life also, he cannot be my disciple. And whosoever does not bear his cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. In verses 28 to 32, Jesus tells us not to build a tower or go to war without first sitting down and counting the cost. And he concludes with verse 33, So likewise, whosoever he be of you that forsaketh not all that he hath, he cannot be my disciple. All these verses are not about believers and unbelievers. They're not about the church and the world. They're about true converts and false converts. The wheats and the tares, the good fish and the bad fish, the sheep and the goats. They're all sitting side by side, even in this church right now. A true convert is a disciple, a false convert is a Pharisee. A disciple fears God more than men. A Pharisee fears men more than God. A disciple lives righteously and reads the word daily to know God more. 
A Pharisee lives self-righteously and thinks they are a good person and take offense to someone like me suggesting that they are right with God just because they don't consume the bread of life on a daily basis. A disciple judges rightly and forsakes the worldly consumption labeled as entertainment. A Pharisee self-justifies and no longer flinches at the sin within what they watch and read and listen to. A disciple lives, uh, lives on a solid foundation by doing what Christ says, and a Pharisee lives on shifting sand by ignoring what Christ says. A disciple forsakes all for Christ. A Pharisee forsakes enough to maintain an illusion of holiness. Disciples are brothers and sisters in Christ because they do the will of the Father in heaven. Pharisees do the will of their father, the devil. Let me read to you two lists from the Bible. The first list, Galatians 5, 22, 23. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, faith, meekness, temperance. Against such there is no law. The second list, Revelation 21, verse 8. But the fearful and unbelieving and the abominable and murderers, and whoremongers, and sorcerers, and adulterers, and all liars, shall have their place in the lake of fire, which burneth with fire and brimstone, which is the second death. Which of these lists best describes you behind closed doors? I've, uh, listen, I've been, I've been getting a lot of thought, and I... I decided that I'm going to give everyone in attendance only, not online, but in attendance only, $1 million. That's, uh, that, that's what I've decided to do. Unfortunately, I do not have a million dollars, much less the millions upon millions required to uh, fulfill that desire. You see, we cannot give to others what we do not have ourselves. We cannot give love if we do not have love. We cannot show others how to have a right relationship with Christ if we do not have a right relationship with Christ. We can't expect others to take up their cross and follow after Christ from our examples if we are not taking up our cross and following after Christ. I see more people that claim to be believers that get more upset about supposed Americans not acting like Americans than they do about supposed Christians not acting like Christians. A disciple is a citizen of heaven. A Pharisee is a citizen of this world. A people cannot govern itself, that cannot govern itself needs to be governed. Tyrants are required for the unruly. Oppressive leaders are God's prescription for a moral people. Let us pursue holiness as the bride of Christ, and the world will follow again. For just as culture is downstream of media, so is government downstream of the church. If we want to see God bless America, America again, we need to start teaching our fellow Americans how to bless God again, in word and in deed. A good place to start is by not inoculating unbelievers against the power of the gospel. Please stop telling the unsaved that Jesus loves them. This is simply an unbiblical thing to do. Jesus says that even liars will have their place in the lake of fire. There is a wrath to come that they must be warned about. If we continue to lead people to Christ as a means of life enhancement, we will continue to collect more false converts. If we rightly apply the law, to, law of God to the unsaved, Psalm 19.7 tells us, the law of God, the Lord is perfect, converting the soul. Do not bring up the good news until they understand the bad news. In John 8.31, Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if ye continue in my word, then are ye my disciples indeed. John 15.8, herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit so shall ye be my disciples. Is your heart heavy for the lost? Do you desire to labor in the harvest? Do you hunger and thirst for righteousness? 
Do you want to know Christ more and make him known to others? Are you living like these words are true? If so, Christ says to you in Revelation 12, 21, 7, He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and I will be his God, and he shall be my son. But if you are waiting for your own personal sign from heaven to tell you to take God at his word, then Christ says to you now, as he said at the first, repent, for the kingdom of God is at hand. Let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, help us to value our very soul more than anything this world has to offer. Lead us to lay down everything at your holy feet. Give us eyes that see, ears that hear, and hearts that understand. Unite this church to be a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto you, which is our reasonable service. Let us know the mysteries of the kingdom of heaven and savor the things that, are, that be of the Lord. Put your yoke upon us, Lord. In the name of above all names, Jesus Christ, amen.